are a couple of things that are going to negatively impact the value of the house. You're gonna need to have the driveway replaced, see how it's cracked. Mm -hmm. A new paved driveway could cost between four and $5,000. Jeff and Amber are also looking at another seven dollars to 10000 to replace the roof. Plus, there's a problem under the house. There's no insulation on the floor or the ductwork under this house. To insulate both of these areas is going to cost between $2,500 and $3,000. Here is the living room. I love the fireplace. The formal dining room and recently updated kitchen are real estate pluses. The three bedrooms, while small, are perfect for the couple's growing family needs. So this is my favorite room in the whole house. This kitchen really adds value to the house and it really substantiates the price that the seller is asking. Wow. But there are problems with this house as well. Everything you see here is really great, but everything that's behind it is not so. The plumbing in this house is old, and it's going to cost you between three dollars and $5,000 to replace all the galvanized pipe. You need to address this. Wow. It's really starting to add up. Coming up, the experts give Jeff and Amber the lowdown on both houses. That's something you're never going to overcome. Find out which home makes the cut. We think the goodbye for you is... Mike Holmes rescues homeowners from renovations gone wrong. 52 families on the same street were taken by the same contractor. Fences were promised, but never delivered. Mike makes it right on Homes on Homes. Tonight at 10.30, 9.30 Central on HGTV. So what do you think? Uh, 30 days, Max. We'll see about that. Glade Lasting Impressions. Two complimentary fragrances alternate to keep things fresh day after day. And not just for 30 days. Um, okay. Our longest lasting plug-ins air freshener lasts for 60. Well, that lasted longer than I thought. I knew it would. Get freshness that won't fade away for 60.
Good morning. I miss you, Doctor. I think you must have been getting a glass of water or something when I came in. Nice to see you here. Thank you. A quorum being present, the Subcommittee on National Security and Foreign Affairs, the hearing entitled U.S. Aid to Pakistan, Planning and Accountability, will come to order. I ask unanimous consent that only the Chairman and Ranking Member of the Subcommittee be allowed to make opening statements, and without objections, that's so ordered. I ask unanimous consent that the gentleman from California, Representative George Miller, be allowed to participate in this hearing. In accordance with the committee rules, he will only be allowed to question the witnesses after all official members of the subcommittee have had their turn. Without objection, so ordered. I ask unanimous consent that the hearing record be kept open for five business days so that all members of the subcommittee will be allowed to submit a written statement for the record. And without objection, that's so ordered. So once again, I say good morning to all of our witnesses that are here today. Um, I really appreciated the written testimony. I think I mentioned that to uh, Dr. Wilder and, uh, and Dr. Ahmed earlier on that. It certainly is uh, food for thought, and uh, Mr. Flake and I were just discussing this. We're anxious to hear your testimony. We'll try to keep our opening statements relatively brief. On October 15, 2009, President Obama signed the Enhanced Partnership with Pakistan Act. It's informally known, as, as everyone here knows, the Kerry Luger Berman Bill. It tripled the United States civilian economic and development assistance to Pakistan to $1.5 billion annually until 2014. While Kerry Luger Berman was a largely bipartisan demonstration of U.S. commitment of long-term assistance to Pakistan, serious concerns remain regarding the ability of USAID and the State Department to effectively and efficiently manage and account for such a massive increase in assistance. In November, I led a congressional delegation to Pakistan in order to investigate, among other things, the status of U.S. assistance programs and the State Department and USAID's capacity to manage and oversee Kerry Luger Berman funding. At the time, Ambassador Holbrook's team and USAID in Pakistan were actively searching for a new delivery model for U.S. civilian assistance to Pakistan. I understand that this policy review is now almost complete. And I look forward to the administration testifying before the subcommittee on their plans in early 2010. During the congressional delegation, we met with Pakistan's civilian leadership and political opposition and a wide variety of civil society members, NGOs, and international contractors. We also traveled to Peshawar to deliver aid supplies directly to the principal hospital that had been receiving wounded from the many bombings there over the several months preceding. No one will be surprised to hear that everyone had a different perspective on how the United States could best deliver aid. Prime Minister Galani prefers more aid to be funneled through the central government. In the provinces, meanwhile, we heard that more money should go straight to the provincial government. Local NGOs boasted that they could cut out the high administrative fees for international contractors and build more domestic capacity, but international NGOs and contractors claimed that the local players did not have the capacity to do so. So in short, our meetings helped us quickly identify all the problems uh, with the various aid delivery models under consideration, but we found no consensus regarding how to go forward. Clearly, there's no silver bullet solution for delivering aid in Pakistan. More disconcerting than the lack of consensus regarding the best aid delivery model was the lack of capacity at USAID in Pakistan. For years, USAID has been marginalized and stripped of personnel while at the same time, U.S. foreign policy has increasingly emphasized aid delivery in high-risk conflict and post-conflict countries like Iraq, Afghanistan, and Pakistan. It's no wonder that USAID has become so dependent on international contractors to plan, manage, and even oversee massive development projects. This challenge is only made more difficult by the current security environment that makes it extremely difficult for either USAID personnel or Western expats to see let alone actively manage or oversee many projects, particularly those in the federally administered tribal areas in northwest frontier province of Pakistan. As a result, both USAID and international contractors are often entirely dependent on sending third-party locals to verify and account for major development and assistance projects. Although I understand the temporary security need for these oversight workarounds, I have a serious concern about USAID's ability to provide long-term oversight and accountability of major projects without ever even seeing them in person. I plan to continue to work with Congress and the administration to bolster USAID's internal staffing and capability. We have to reverse USAID's decline of the last decade if it's to serve as a central tool of U.S. foreign policy in South Asia and the Middle East, a task that has been assigned but not given the tools to fulfill. In the meantime, however, any new plan for U.S. civilian assistance to Pakistan must factor in USAID's limited capacity both limited personnel to actually manage and oversee contracts and for security reasons, 
limited visibility on many of its projects. For today's hearing, we've brought together three experts with a great variety and depth of experience in both Pakistan and U.S. assistance program. I don't expect any of them to provide the silver bullet solution, but I do hope that you can give us some fresh perspectives on this very difficult challenge. And of course, to the extent that you have that silver bullet, don't hesitate to share it. Thank you. Mr. Flake. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank the witnesses. Uh, I share the concerns that the uh, Chairman has expressed about uh, the, the, the pace of this uh, aid going in. It, it seems to be more uh, supply side driven rather than demand side at this point. Um, I, I also share the concern uh, and I un understand the issues with regard to security, uh, but the inability to actually see uh, where some of this money is spent uh, in the end is, is troublesome uh, for a committee that provides oversight. So anxious to hear the testimony and I look forward to the, uh, the administration witnesses uh, in the new year to, to hear what they have uh, planned going ahead uh, to remedy the situation. But uh, thank you for coming. Thank you, Mr. Flake. The subcommittee will now receive testimony from the panel before us today. I'd like to just briefly introduce the entire panel and then we'll start with Dr. Fair. Dr. Christine Fair is an assistant professor with the Center for Peace and Security Studies at Georgetown University's School of Foreign Service. She previously served as a senior political scientist with the RAND Corporation, a political officer to the United Nations Assistance Mission to Afghanistan in Kabul, and as a senior research associate at the Center for Conflict Analysis and Prevention at the United States Institute for Peace. Her current research focuses on political and military affairs in South Asia. She holds a PhD from the University of Chicago. Dr. Andrew Wilder is the Research Director for Policy Process at Tufts University's Feinstein Center. Prior to joining the center, he worked in Afghanistan, where he established and directed Afghanistan's first independent policy research institute, the Afghanistan Research and Evaluation Unit. Between 1986 and 2001, Dr. Wilder worked for several different international NGOs, managing humanitarian and development programs in Pakistan and Afghanistan. His research and publications explore the politics of civil service reform and electoral politics and policies in Pakistan. He holds a PhD from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. And our friend Dr. Samina Ahmed is the International Crisis Group South Asia Project Director. She has testified from Pakistan uh, to here uh, by video before. As I understand, uh, Dr. Wilder has also done on at least one occasion. Uh, and maybe Dr. Fair, for all I know. I, you haven't been on the video yet. We'll get you there. We <laughs> Uh, but we appreciate the fact that you've traveled all the way here today from Pakistan to, uh, to work with us. Based in Islamabad, Dr. Ahmed oversees ICG's work in Pakistan, Afghanistan, India, and Nepal. Prior to joining ICG, she held research positions at Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government and the Institute of Regional Studies. Her areas of expertise include South Asian affairs, democratic transitions in authoritarian states, and ethnic and religious conflict. She holds a PhD from the Australian National University. And we appreciate that all of you are here today, that you're going to share your testimony. As I said, we've read your written testimony with great effect. Uh, I do note that if you were to deliver that, each of you would be significantly over 15 or 20 minutes or whatever. We would like to have some time for questions and answers. So if you could uh, verbalize in about five or so minutes, we're not going to uh, drop the hammer exactly five, but uh, far shorter than it would for the entire presentation of the written testimony. That written testimony will be put on the record by unanimous consent, and we'll have had that, or those that haven't had a chance to read it will read it. So uh, first let me square in the witnesses. It's our practice to do that before every hearing. Please stand and raise your right hand. Do you test solemnly square to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? The record will please reflect that all the witnesses have answered in the affirmative. And Dr. Fair, if you'd be kind enough to uh, begin. Oh, this isn't on? Oh, there we go. Sorry about that. <laughs> As a non-USAID practitioner, my comments will draw from my own experience in Pakistan since 1991. As an Urdu speaker who's traveled throughout the country, from survey work that I've conducted with various collaborators, as well as from reviews of the relevant secondary literature. As we know, since 9-11, aid has become very much a tool in the global war on terrorism. Yet in my interactions with Pakistanis since 9-11, many persons have communicated a deep awareness of and quite frankly discomfort with Washington's instrumentalism of its assistance, as I note at length in my written statement. Pakistanis complain bitterly about the modalities of USAID, noting that the provision of large sums of cash without significant oversight and monitoring actually fosters corruption. 
This has fostered a deep cynicism that Washington explicitly seeks to ensure that Pakistan remains weak, riddled by corruption, and more vulnerable to international pressure generally, and that of the U.S. in particular. As I describe in my written statement, beliefs about corruption in some measure drive Pakistani popular support for Sharia, and that draws from the survey work that I've done recently. It is not clear that these perceptions can be managed through a public diplomacy campaign, however sophisticated. Arguably, if the United States wishes to move public opinion in Pakistan, it will have to change how it works with Pakistan and engages its citizenry. Moving forward, considerations for future USAID programming in Pakistan, it certainly, as you noted, easier to identify the problems than it is to offer effective solutions. Yet I present a number of steps in consideration that may be useful as USAID reconsiders its future aid delivery mechanisms in Pakistan. First, there is a dire need to better discern Pakistani preferences. USAID personnel have conceded that the pressures to execute does not allow efforts to discern Pakistani's preferences, with a critical, uh, which is critical to generally demand-driven programming. This results in supply-driven programming that may not address the needs and aspirations of Pakistanis and even engender frustration with the foreign-driven agenda. I provide lengthy examples of current deficiency in this regard in my written statement. Equally important, USA does not collect data to inform their branding decisions, which is absolutely strange given the technical expertise to do this sort of market research in Pakistan. There is a shocking paucity of robust data about Pakistanis generally, the views they have on a wide range of domestic and foreign policies, the sources of information that Pakistanis access and which inform their views, and the legitimacy and trustworthiness of various sources of information. For years, development economists have deba debated the vices and virtues of community-based development programming. Unfortunately, there is no obvious way to resolve the debate between community-based development and those provided through sub-national or even national channels because there are really no robust studies of the, the relative benefits of any of these mechanisms. World Bank analysts Mansouri and Rao have conducted an extensive review of community-based uh, development projects. And they conclude that the success of these initiatives depend critically upon local, cultural, and social systems. And quote, it is therefore best done, not with wholesale application of best practices applied from projects that were successful in other contexts, but by careful learning by doing. This requires a long-term horizon and willingness to engage in a monitoring and evaluation process that is not only rigorous, but is designed to allow for learning and program modification. This description is exactly what USAID seems ill-positioned to do, yet the literature suggests it's not a luxury, but rather a necessity. It's worth reflecting upon the role of NGOs in particular, certainly since you mentioned them, given that one likely movement away from the large institutional contractor approach with their high overhead may be to increasingly rely upon Pakistan-based NGOs. I think many people on this panel can attest that NGOs are seen with considerable dubiety in Pakistan, ranging as the personal hobby of elite housewives to mechanisms to basically take money from the U.S. tax dollars uh, and put them into the pockets of those that run those NGOs. So it's absolutely critical that USA discern which NGOs are credible and most importantly, which ones are seen as credible. In my testimony, I suggest that it might be useful for USA to set up the kind of mechanism that we have here in the States that puts transparency into NGOs, the way they use expenditures, their service delivery, and so forth. Those sorts of systems might be able to, over time, increase public confidence in NGOs because they can discern more credibly which ones do their job and which ones are, are basically rent-seeking organizations. But there are other potential problems associated with using NGOs, and I cite some studies of this in my testimony, uh, namely the civil society organizations, sorry for the um, abbreviation, Civil society organizations that rely upon external funders, oddly enough, enough, become less capable of mobilizing social capital and strengthening their civil societies, and that's because their constituencies become the funders, not memberships. So this is certainly a principal agent problem that USAID will have to deal with if they pursue programming through NGOs. One of the methods that, that I have advocated with my World Bank colleagues is actually using the markets and uh, generating demand for change. One of the examples that I give pertains to education. Given the pervasive problems with some important ministries, USAID may want to consider pursuing private sector solutions to public sector problems which are better pursued, quite frankly, by Pakistanis. Uh, I look at the, the education sector reform. And I, 
argue that Washington has very little scope to change the either the madrasa curriculum or the public school curriculum, and that in fact Washington's efforts to do so are really seen as efforts to de-Islamize. And this has produced a number of backlashes against U.S. efforts, which I've written about at length elsewhere. One of the things that the World Bank has actually done in an experiment is that they provide um, report cards for student and teacher and school performance. And what's interesting, when there's a cost neutral way, parents actually shift to private schools. There's a lot of misunderstandings about private schools and their cost structures. I say in my testimony, private schools are the fastest growing segment in Pakistan. They're actually one of the most efficient ways of delivering a higher quality education for reasons that I discuss at length. Another uh, way forward that that work suggests to me is actually information-based programming. What USA does in many cases is it tries to supply a reform from, from some sort of government agency. The example I give in my testimony is corruption. So efforts to clean up corruption, be it in the police or in a particular ministry, are likely to fail because Pakistanis themselves are part of the, the corruption system. So any mechanism that engages in, in civ civic education that, to sort of communicate to Pakistanis that they themselves participate in the corruption problem that corruption is not simply done to them, might be a way of buttressing the supply-driven aid. So in other words, trying to create demand to support the supply-driven effort. The final set of issues that I look at, given that aid has been securitized, especially since 9-11, but one could make the argument that aid to Pakistan has been securitized since 1947, is that there's simply no evidence um, that demonstrates that securitized aid actually meets these objectives. I provide two examples that were conducted by a team led by Jacob Shapiro at Stanford and his colleagues, and he uses the case of Iraq, and I want to note that he has to use the Commander or Res Emergency Response Program funds because USAID funds were so encumbered with multiple layers of contracting that it simply made doing the analysis impossible, whereas SERP was actually much more direct in assessing its outcomes. What they found with the SERP, the SERP funds is that delivering community service actually resulted in a modicum or a modest decrease in violence, but that the monitoring and the understanding requirements of achieving this modest results were really quite onerous. In contrast, in a similar study that he did with his colleagues on unemployment in Iraq, he actually found that unemployment was negatively correlated with violence. So in other words, the more unemployment there was, the less violence there was. So if you look at the literature, you'll find that there's simply not um, evidence that says securitized aid achieves the objectives that are specified in various documents, putting aid as a part of the counterinsurgency problem. And I think Dr. Wilder's experience certainly buttresses that. So in conclusion, a review of the literature coupled with my own experience in the country does suggest that there is no magic bullet and there is no substitute for experimentation and rigorous evaluation. Indeed, there's a strong argument to be made for experimenting with different forms of aid delivery through NGOs, through subnational as well as national means, and different levels of involvement of local communities, as well as the oversight mechanisms in subjecting these pilot programs to robust assessment, preferably with some degree of randomization, to determine the impact of these interventions on the treatment group. Effective programs should be retained and applied to other areas with appropriate analysis and reoptimization, and ineffective programs, and heavens knows there, there are quite a bit of those, should be eliminated unless they can be implemented successfully elsewhere in the country with suitable modification. Admittedly, this will be difficult for USAID, given the pressures that the mission is under to execute programs, permission priorities, given the security environment, as well as the potential ethical concerns about risks inherent in fielding different experimental programs in different areas. But I want to point out there's no a priori way of knowing that the non-randomized approaches that they currently use offer any benefit at all. Given the frustration that Pakistanis have expressed about U.S. intentions and the explicit securitization of aid, it's important to assess whether the benefits of USAID interventions in mitigating violence and anti-Americanism are sufficiently significant in size and scope relative to the public relations problems such securitized aid appears to pose. Thank you. I note that we're one-third of the way through without the silver bullet, so we've got to keep moving on this. Dr. Wilder, please. Distinguished members of the committee, um, thank you for asking me to testify today. Um, I was born in Pakistan, lived, worked, and studied there for about 30 years. So the topic of today's hearing is something that is important to me personally as well as professionally. 
I have firsthand uh, seen some of the very positive effects of, of U.S. Uh, aid to Pakistan, um, but I've also seen some of the damage uh, done to a uh, U.S. image in Pakistan, as well as to the development efforts in Pakistan, of sort of a feast and famine approach to development aid to Pakistan. Uh, these feasts and famines, I argue both of them, have been harmful, and they result from what I believe is a misplaced faith in the effectiveness of aid in promoting security objectives rather than just development objectives. My testimony today is based on a study I'm doing at the Feinstein Center, basically looking at this issue of how effective is aid in promoting security objectives. And our main finding to date is that while development assistance can be very effective in promoting humanitarian and development objectives, there's actually remarkably little evidence that it is effective in winning hearts and minds and promoting security objectives. Development aid program first and foremost to achieve security objectives rather than development often fails to achieve either. And I'll argue, point out later in some cases can actually do more harm than good. Um, U.S. national security interests have always had a major influence over our foreign aid programs and how our foreign aid dollars get spent. But I think not since Vietnam have we seen aid so explicitly viewed as a weapon system, uh, especially in counterinsurgency contexts. And I think this is illustrated by the recent publication in April of this year by the U.S. Army of a handbook called The Commander's Guide to Money as a Weapon System which provides guidance on how to use money to, quote, win the hearts and minds of the indigenous population to facilitate defeating the insurgents. This assumption that aid can win hearts and minds um, is, is widely held by policymakers and practitioners alike, and it's having a major impact on our aid policies as well as our counterinsurgency policies. It's resulting in a sharp increase in aid to countries like Pakistan and Afghanistan, and it's also resulting within those countries of uh, a disproportionate amount of aid go being programmed to the most insecure areas rather than secure areas. So when I'm doing my research in Afghanistan in the central or northern parts of the country, you often hear bitter complaints from Afghans there as to why are we being penalized for being peaceful, because the lion's share of U.S. development aid is programmed to the uh, insecure regions of the south and southeast. And we see a similar thing in Fatah, the $750 million over five years to Fatah, the federally administered tribal areas, where actually only 2% of Pakistan's population live, I think also reflects that tendency. And I think, I'd like, I think policymakers should be aware that given how widespread this assumption is, and given its powerful impact on our aid and our counterinsurgency policies, there's remarkably little evidence to actually show that aid is an effective weapon system or is effective in winning hearts and minds in contexts like uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan. I think the Pakistan earthquake response is a very good example of this. I was personally involved in that. I saw firsthand the tremendous response of Pakistani citizens, first of all, the Pakistan army and the international community led by the U.S. to what was a very effective humanitarian response to the earthquake. Um, the U.S. was the single largest donor to that response. $510 million was fairly rapidly programmed, as well as 23 uh, helicopters provided life-saving assistance in the aftermath of the earthquake. I think the U.S. would have responded in, with humanitarian aid to a disaster of that magnitude anywhere in the world. However, there is no doubt that the scale of the response in Pakistan um, was affected by the desire to win hearts and minds and get, gain additional support in a war on terror ally. The Wall Street Journal in an editorial shortly after the earthquake referred to this as one of America's most significant hearts and minds successes so far in the Muslim world. And there is a widespread perception that this uh, response did win hearts and minds. Um, I'm arguing though that in reality that benefit was actually quite minimal. Um, a public opinion poll done just a month after the earthquake did show a sharp boost in, uh, in, in Pakistani public um, opinion towards the U.S. From, it went from 23 percent prior to the earthquake to 46 percent. However, the next time that poll was done six months later, 
um, public opinion was back down to 26 percent. And then the next year, the Pew, Pew uh, CERT poll showed it was down to 15 percent. And today, I think we're at around 16 percent. So again, there maybe was a very short-term uh, benefit to that half a billion dollars in earthquake response, but not long-term. And I think the point there is that that was an incredibly effective humanitarian response, um, but with limited hearts and minds benefit. My research from Afghanistan shows similar results. Um, we have found that Afghanistan, in Afghanistan, development aid carefully programmed is, can have very effective posi and positive development outcomes. But there's very little evidence that the billions now being spent on aid to Afghanistan is actually translating into significant hearts and minds benefits or stabilization benefits. Um, at a time when more aid is being given to Afghanistan than ever before in its history, the popular perception of aid in Pakistan is nearly universally negative. Our field research in Afghanistan not only shows that aid is not winning hearts and minds and having a stabilizing effect, but the sheer volume of that aid, especially in the insecure areas, can actually have destabilizing effects. Um, there's many ways in which it can do that. Aid can create winners and losers in that zero-sum society or perceptions of winners and losers. Uh, there's mounting evidence about how the political economy of aid and security contracting uh, can actually result in significant amounts of money ending up being paid to the Taliban by construction companies um, as protection money for their, their road building and other construction projects in these insecure areas. But the most important way in which I think aid is destabilizing in Afghanistan is its role in fueling corruption. And it's nearly inevitable in a highly insecure area with limited implementation and oversight capacity that large amounts of aid in those areas are going to fuel corruption. Um, this corruption in turn has a very corrosive, I think, and destabilizing effect uh, by reducing the legitimacy of the Afghan government. And while donors are in the U.S. and people are rightly criticizing the Afghan government in terms of its uh, not cracking down on corruption, I think we are too little uh, point looking at ourselves because our aid money is contributing to that problem by, I think, providing too much with too little oversight in that context. And I think, uh, although I've not done the research in Fatah yet, that I suspect that in, in a similar environment, a highly insecure area in the border regions of Pakistan, large amounts of aid could also have similar effects. So in conclusion, I believe the prioritization since the 1960s, actually, of security over development objectives has been one of the main factors undermining the effectiveness of U.S. development aid to Pakistan. And with the passage of the seven and a half billion Kerry Luger bill, an amount that exceeds the total U.S. aid spending since the start of its program in 1951 through 2007, it is more important than ever before to question how U.S. aid to Pakistan can be spent more effectively and accountably. With U.S. foreign aid now explicitly viewed as a weapon system in counterinsurgency context, before appropriating billions more dollars, I urge the, sub the subcommittee and Congress to demand more evidence that it is an effective weapon system. It is hard to imagine that the U.S. would go to battle in any other, with, with any other weapon system whose effectiveness is based to such a great extent on unproven assumptions and wishful thinking. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Weld. I appreciate that. Dr. Ahmed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A pleasure to be here and to, to testify at this very important hearing. Let me start off by saying this. Is U.S. aid desirable in the Pakistani context? Yes, it is. Is it needed in the Pakistani context? Yes, it is. How effective will that assistance be? That will depend on the mechanisms in, that are used to provide that assistance, that will also depend on the oversight of that assistance by the U.S. government, but also by the United States Pakistani counterparts. If these counterparts are indeed representative of their communities, indeed have, are themselves accountable, and that the processes that, they, that are used are transparent, 
Will then this assistance that has been allocated to Pakistan, the 1.5 billion um, a year under the Enhanced Partnership with Pakistan Act, as well as the $750 million, of which we know very little as yet, has been spent on FATA. Um, will that be effective? I don't think there's absolutely any doubt about it. The problem lies in the fact that we are looking at assistance in the Pakistani context, also in the context of Pakistan's relationship with the United States, in particular, relations with the United States in the last 10 years. Pakistani perceptions were shaped by U.S. assistance to a military regime which is why this bill is important, which is why also, as this committee knows, there was a pushback by those institutions within Pakistan that feel um, strengthening civilian partners would undermine their own standing, internal standing. Specifically in the context of FATA, let me just say this, having spoken to FATA representatives, having spoken to FATA stakeholders, folks who belong and live and will be the recipients of this community? Do they want it? Yes, they do. Do they believe that it's going to be effective under the present circumstances? No, they don't. Is that because there is a flaw in the way assistance is being provided? I go into great detail in the testimony on the problems that USAID and its implementing partners face in FATA itself. And the real problem in the fact that this assistance cannot be delivered as effectively as it should lies in the larger political framework that exists, the mechanisms, the bureaucratic mechanisms that are there in place. If there is no political reform, and we stress upon that very strongly, this is a civilian government, it's an elected government, it understands the importance of reaching out to the communities, also understands the importance of winning the peace. Um, but without that reform agenda and the first beginnings of that reform agenda have just been suggested. There's been a pushback again by the military um, as far as this reform agenda is concerned. Until there's political reform in, in FATA, USAID and its implementing partners, doesn't matter if they're local NGOs, international NGOs, or Beltway, Beltway bandits, are going to have to work through the FATA Secretariat, the FATA Development Authority, through the Maliks, and the political agents. This entire bureaucracy and its clients do not have any links to the community, nor have they any interest in consulting the communities. Um, let me also say this, where while we are talking about what is happening within the FATA context, we have a very large proportion, almost a third of, of the residents of FATA who are now internally displaced because of the conflict. Uh, because of military operations, because they're caught between the military and the militants. Delivering assistance to these communities, I think, is one way to reach the communities that are still within FATA. It's a mechanism ca that can be used. What will be important is for everybody, I think, to understand that as these operations end, when they end, and how they end also matter. If you're just going to see militant leaders moving from one agency to the other to make a return, with no safety and security for residents, it's not going to make any difference. If there is no comprehensive relief, secure return, and reconstruction plan for the IDPs with U.S. assistance, uh, the civilian government will lose uh, whatever credibility it has. Um, so that need for political reform and the importance of making sure that the political structures in FATA are indeed accountable and transparent means that there needs to be First, support for the reform agenda, which is just the beginnings of opening the doors to political reform in FATA. But also an understanding that unless these, there are mechanisms that are put in place for community and civil society participation, as well as, and let me emphasize this, with the elected representatives of the Pakistani parliament in the province, Northwest Frontier province, and in the center, in the National Assembly, that is, I think, a mechanism that has as yet not been used and could be used to far greater effectiveness. These are folks who know, as indeed members of Congress do, the needs of their constituents. These are also people who are accountable to those constituents and will, not, will win or lose elections based on their performance. Um, bringing them into the process of a delivery in terms of oversight, 
would make a huge difference. Insecurity will be used also deliberately to deprive even those international humanitarian organizations and development organizations that would want to risk going into, into these insecure conflict zones. Um, and there, I think, again, international humanitarian law is something which is absolutely essential when we're looking at how this conflict is playing out. Um, preparing the ground for a safe and secure return for the IDPs. Andrew talked about um, the situation after the earthquake. Let's not forget what happened after the earthquake. Right after the earthquake, the relief and reconstruction that was supposed to take place was taken over by a military apparatus. There was no link to the community. There was no understanding of the needs of the people. That is what we don't want to see happen again in these conflict zones as people begin to return home, and indeed millions already have in Malakand Division. On the whole, as far as the entire project is concerned of, of USAID assistance, there are going to be difficult choices. There are no silver bullets, unfortunately. But what does matter is that if we see transparency, accountability, and the mechanisms, the democratic institutions and mechanisms that are there now in this nascent uh, democracy being utilized by the American partners on the ground, that is possibly one effective way to go. Thank you, sir. Well, thank you, Doctor. I appreciate that. And, uh, and again, you were very helpful to us when we were actually there uh, getting some insight into the area, particular uh, the Northwest Frontier Province and Fatah on that. I have to say it's, it's, uh, it's not entirely encouraging uh, to listen to what we've heard this morning, nor was it that encouraging, frankly, during our visit, uh, a little short of a week that we spent there and talking to any number of parties. It makes uh, some of us wonder, you know, this securitization of aid, I think is the way Dr. Fair put it in her uh, testimony, uh, this whole uh, counterinsurgency theory that if we somehow meld the security aspect with the development aspect and uh, we're going to contain and combat and mitigate terrorism doesn't seem to have a great deal of uh, validity in terms of studies or reports or any evidence on that. Um, it doesn't seem to promote peace. It doesn't seem to be mitigating any conflicts. It certainly doesn't seem to be dissuading populations from embracing extremism. Uh, in fact, if I listen to Dr. Wilder and, and uh, Dr. Fair in particular, it seems to be fomenting distrust and encouraging rampant theories of uh, U.S. Um, uh, animus toward the Pakistanis, in fact. So it, uh, it's, it makes us wonder whether or not we've got it wrong when we look at the counterinsurgency uh, policy on that. Do you see, uh, Dr. Wilder, your, uh, your work is directly contradicting the counterinsurgency uh, theories that are bounding? It's questioning a central tenet about the counterinsurgency strategy. And I think there's been very much focus, and all the debate is on troop numbers. Um, but in the coin mantra of clear, hold, build, the build piece actually doesn't get much questioning. Um, and I want to emphasize, I'm, I've been a development worker most of my life. I'm a strong believer in the importance of development and development aid. Um, but I think that you know, we shouldn't assume that development aid can uh, defeat these uh, or have a big impact on what's driving conflict in some of these uh, co contexts. And, we're hoping to shift our research more into Pakistan during this coming year, but if you look at what's driving conflict in, 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 Pakistan, in Afghanistan, but I also suspect in the border regions, it's actually, I think, not first and foremost poverty or lack of infrastructure or lack of social services. All those things are important, and we should be trying to address those because those are important for development sake, but those are not the things fueling the conflict. So I don't think we should assume that by spending hundreds of millions of dollars quickly in a context like that, it's going to change the conflict dynamic. And as I said, what's alarming from Afghanistan is indeed that actually that assumption is exacerbating the problem by fueling corruption, which I think is a big issue that delegitimizes governments and actually creates instability. Would I ask this of all three of you, would I be misreading uh, your collective testimony if I, uh, I said that I see in there some indication that we ought to sever the concept of development aid from security. We ought to make sure that we take the time to collect the data, analyze it, and implement the best delivery model 
um, or whether or not any particular NGO or series of NGOs are the best people or the government's the best people to deliver it, and recognize a sort of a need for having quality projects uh, with great impact as opposed to a large number of projects and a qu quick disbursement of the money. Would that be, uh, Dr. Ahmed, is that, that a fair statement? To, to there needs to be a framework within which aid is dispersed. It's a, let me say this, from my experience of Afghanistan, and I've worked in Afghanistan since, two, actually, for the last 25 years, but we, I've had a standing office in Afghanistan since January of 2002. Our concern was with that big project, the Ring Road. All that money put into that one high-profile project when the needs were quite different on the ground. So I do think that one needs to do a little bit of a balancing act before all the money is put in, for example, in the Pakistani context, as is being suggested, into either energy or water, one high-profile uh, $200, $300 million project without actually understanding the politics involved. And I think it's going to be crucial. Let me just say about one issue, water. This is the most contentious of resources within Pakistan. It's a federal framework. All four federal units are, you know, basically fighting over a very scarce resource. So doing the homework beforehand uh, and then determining if this is going to be desirable without the kind of consultation you need on the ground, um, I would hesitate to go down that road. Doctor? I, just, um, I, I also wanted to emphasize that I'm not saying that there's, prob there's not going to be an effect anywhere. I think you need to do that research and look at each individual context because they differ. It could be that conflict in some country is actually generated uh, due to disputes over natural resources and very conflict sensitive aid program that looks to try to address that where the different competing communities can, you can have a win-win situation. In that context, aid could mitigate uh, you know, uh, conflict there. My point is, though, in the Pakistan-Afghanistan context, I don't see that those are the main factors driving the insurgency and therefore will not be the main factors that mitigate them. Um, and just in terms of the aid effectiveness, I think when we're trying to spend it to achieve the security objective, as the security gets worse and worse, we try to spend more and more. And that's what we see in Afghanistan. We see no evidence that where we've spent most of our money that security has gotten any better. If, if anything, it's gotten a lot worse. And I'm not arguing causality there, but I think it creates this, no. this vicious link. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of political pressure coming from, from this country uh, and the policymakers here or whatever, uh, thinking that because we've had such theories of counterinsurgency uh, put out there now and, and uh, the idea of tying this development into security on that, uh, we've got this notion that, well, we're giving a large amount of money and it's got to go to work tomorrow. We've got to see something happening tomorrow. And, and unfortunately, what we've seen happening is spending, but not necessarily results on that. Mr. Flake. Go ahead. Did you have something to say? Go ahead. And uh, no, fine. Mr. Flake is, uh, is going to do that, and we'll give him a little more time on the other side, so that's good. Thank you. Thanks. Well, go ahead, yes. So in April, with my colleagues, we conducted a 6,000-person survey, which is statistically it allows us I'm to sorry, Mr. Chairman, talk, could you, talk about you, things. Could you pull your microphone up just oh, a little I'm bit? Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. So in April, uh, with various colleagues, I conducted a survey of 6,000 Pakistanis, which allow us a lot of granularity at the subnational level. We were explicitly looking at why do Pakistanis support different militant groups. And it what we have really come, uh, what we've drawn from that survey, and I'm happy to present different results uh, to you if you're interested, it's really about the politics of the militant groups. And they distinguish across the different militant groups, ranging from the Kashmiri groups all the way down to Al Qaeda, the Afghan Taliban, and the sectarian groups. And it's not driven by economics in any consistent way. It's not driven by, by educational background in any consistent way. In fact, those variables behave very differently when you look at different militant groups. So when I look at all of the policy documents that drive USAID, using securitized aid as a part of COIN, I myself cited the interagency COIN manual. Again, there's just no evidence. It, it seems to be driven by the politics of these militant groups and whether or not people support what those groups do. Thank you. Dr. Ahmed, you, you talked about uh, 
obviously the problem of uh, in FATA in particular um, using well making use of the uh, existing government officials and, and uh, institutions within government as opposed to, to international NGOs how I mean <coughs> understanding that we need to move quickly there uh, how do we do it? And, and this kind of goes into what do Dr. Farrah talked about in a written testimony about, you know, you ought to have two tests, uh, whether somebody is uh, uh, trustworthy in the eyes of the U.S. taxpayer, for example, or the U.S. government, and whether they're trustworthy in terms of the target population there. How do you balance that in, in FATA, recognizing, although it's a small segment of the population, it's a troublesome area where we do want to win hearts and minds or whatever you want to say. but recognizing we have to move quickly, how do you balance the, the need to target the population directly there and make use of organizations or institutions that are up and going? Or are there sufficient NGOs that are ready to move that we can ignore the troublesome elected officials or appointed officials or whoever is within government there? Do you want to illuminate a little on that, in FATA in particular? FATA is a case apart from the rest of Pakistan. And I think that is one thing that could, should be recognized from the onset. The bureaucracy we are talking about in FATA is a separate bureaucracy because of the way that is kept apart from the rest of the country in constitutional terms. The reason why this bureaucracy is in absolute control of whatever happens on the ground is because of the rules of the political constitutional legal game. And that is why this bureaucracy is such an impediment. It's the least transparent. It is the least responsive to local community needs because it doesn't have to be. It's in, you know, you, part of residents have no political rights, no civil rights, no legal rights because of the structures that are there in place. Our concern is if you want to, if the assumption is that the government of Pakistan is who we should be working with, yes, the government of Pakistan is actually the provincial government, it's a federal right. government, and then you have a very separate subsect of that government, which is a FATA bureaucracy. Right. Our Does concern it, is, can you find, if is in the specific context of FATA, is this bureaucracy going to be an efficient way of dispersing assistance that will reach the communities? This bureaucracy doesn't even have any links to the communities. Mm. It works through its own clients. Um, are there NGOs, local or international, that have a track record of working on FATA? Yes, they are. Do they have the capacity of dealing with large amounts of money? No, they don't. Um, so one will really have to look at how you can factor in, how do you actually consult the communities? They are elected representatives from FATA. They don't have legal powers under the present political setup but they have some links to their cons constituencies. Not great. There is the Northwest Frontier Province, let's not forget. I think Dr. Wilder talked about this, let's not forget that you know there are links between these areas. Northwest Frontier Province, there's not, it's an artificial distinction between FATA and the rest of the Northwest Frontier Province. And there, there are no real security issues involved in actually ensuring that you can access the leadership of FATA civil society, do you know there's a FATA union of journalists, a FATA union of lawyers? Um, it's not as though a FATA tribal forum of businessmen. It's not as though there, there is no civil society and no community that can be accessed. It's if you work specifically only through this bureaucracy, you will lose that opportunity of accessing the communities completely. All right. So, I mean, we have a problem in Pakistan in general with when aid is delivered. Uh, by the government that uh, the, the target population views that skeptically because they don't trust particularly some of the military institutions. You're saying that's even more so in the FATA because they don't have the, the links to the target population? Absolutely. So it's even more difficult. And, and more so, let's not forget as far as the IDPs are concerned, and it's a huge number of FATA residents that can be accessed today if need be. The military prevents access, full humanitarian access or access to development agencies to these communities. And I think that's a clear message that should be sent from Washington, uh, that when we give our money, our taxpayers' money, we're not going to give it to institutions that are not transparent, that are not accountable. And we certainly have no intention of bypassing the communities that will be the beneficiaries of this assistance. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Luke Kabaya, you recognize for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, one of the um, in our in our paper on this, it, it indicates that uh, aid to Pakistan is divided into five different categories: economic growth, education, health, governance, and human assistance, as well as uh, major assistance with the development of uh, the FATA areas. Uh, can you give me a breakdown of uh, any of the three of you, whoever wants to jump in on this, uh, with regards to these categories? Uh, the amount of money that we're, we're spending in each one, the importance of that uh, is one of a higher importance than the other. You've pretty well touched on our problems with the, uh, with the FATA folks um, and the ability to, to use those funds. Yes, Dr. Fair. Unfortunately, I don't have the, the money with me, but one of the things, and I, it, it pertains to the FATA issue that I've been particularly dismayed by, and I know Dr. Ahmed and I think Dr. Wilder have <coughs> remarked upon this as well, is that the aid was never conditional upon uh, encouraging the Pakistani government to change the constitutional structure that governs FATA. And one of the things that strikes me where USAID might be more effective is actually helping the Pakistani government make that transition. So for example, while there are civil society organizations, um, the judicial system hasn't been linked to the rest of Pakistan because there's no right of appeal. There are no police in FATA. There are these highly unprofessional tribal levies. And of course, the Frontier Corps is a paramilitary organization. It's always struck me that the more effective way of trying to reach FATA has actually been to incentivize the Pakistan government to incorporate FATA into the rest of Pakistan as opposed to keeping it separate. Is that where most of the money is going now to the development of this area? I mean, well, does, it, does any of the money go to the rest of the uh, the Pakistani uh, Oh, there's a people? huge aid program. Okay. Out, what percentage from, from goes to uh, the development of FATA's areas? Do you have well, any idea? Just there's roughly? $750 million that's been going to FATA, and that's in addition to uh, an additional security assistance program that's supposed to be aiming the Frontier Corps. So relative to the rest of the programming in Pakistan, it's actually relatively modest. But you know, it's interesting when you talk to Pakistanis, you know, because USAID can't be subtle about its aid objectives in FATA. So Pakistanis have this belief that we're largely only operating in FATA, and that fuels this additional conspiracy about the securitization of aid, that if you weren't in Afghanistan, you wouldn't care about FATA. So in other words, you don't care about Pakistan, you care about FATA because of the insurgency. But so well, what you're saying, though, is that, the, that most of the money goes to other areas of, of Pakistan for economic growth, health, uh, and other things like that. And, and my question, I guess, is how effective are we? I mean, we, the, the, the FATA uh, the issue has been, the, the, you know, dominating the discussion here. What about the rest of the aid to the rest of the, uh, the, of the country in the areas that it's supposed to go into, such as economic growth, health, governance, humanitarian assistance? Does it go to those areas? Is it effective? Well, they don't know because they don't do those evaluations. And, and that's what I find so frustrating. And when you, about, say you say they don't do those evaluations, who are you talking you about? You say it really doesn't evaluate the impact of its programs. You know, they'll talk about how many skills they've built. They'll, but for example, there's no real meaningful measure of how the quality of education <coughs> has been improved. So there's this tendency to focus upon outputs, not outcomes. And t in fairness to USAID, um, evaluations are expensive, especially when conducted through institutional contractors. And um, at the risk of, uh, you know, projecting self-interest, I think USAID should be partnering, partnering more with the academic community because, A, they have more luxurious timelines, they have a more competitive cost structure, and they actually have the academic expertise, and I'm talking about quantitative analysts in particular, to help them isolate um, the impacts of their pro programming upon outcomes. And so the other alternative to think about is actually partnering USAID with programs, for example, like what Dr. Wilder does, as opposed to relying upon these institutional contractors. I've seen institutional contractors grade other institutional contractors' homework. And when there's a limited corral of these contractors, it's pretty easy to tell who's done what analysis. And it's just game theory. You know, everyone's basically going to say that every program did more or less a, a good job because they don't want to then be subjected to a negative critique by another institutional contractor for their programming. So what you're saying is there are, there are no measurable, uh, there's, been, there's been no measured, uh, measurement of the outcomes of the programs to date uh, with regards to uh, the other, uh, other folks here with regards to economic activity, health. In other words, <clears throat> there's, no, there's been no discussion of how many uh, shots have been delivered, how many more uh, doctor outputs, visits, how many people have been outcomes. taken to the doctor, how many, you know, whether the, the birth rate has increased or whether the, the cause of uh, other diseases have gone down. None of that's been 
quantitatively dis measure? Well, you can measure outputs. Like they can say how many schools they've built, how many teachers they've trained, but they can't talk about outcomes, which is the quality, for example, of the education. The other problem is that because they don't randomize interventions, so for example, let's right now they're really focusing on particular districts that are affected by insecurity. So it's going to be, since we're putting more money into more insecure areas, and this is what Dr. Wilder talked about, we're always going to have a causality that more insecurity is correlated with more money being spent. This is, and it's very difficult to disentangle that um, because they're not putting money into areas that are, that are least secure. So in other words, if they were to randomize their intervention, they could actually isolate the effect of the intervention. But for political reasons and for mission-driven reasons, they don't feel that they have the luxury to do that. But yet it's absolutely essential to generally determining the impact of an intervention. Okay. Thank you. I see my time is up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you sir, uh, on that. Mr. Duncan, you're recognized for five minutes. <clears throat> Well, thank you uh, very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I don't really have any questions, but I do have some comments. Um, I want to read uh, uh, something from a Washington Post story of October 8th. And uh, it said in this story, it said, the Obama administration's strategy for bolstering Pakistan's civilian government was shaken Wednesday when political opposition and military leaders there sharply criticized a new U.S. assistance plan as interfering with the country's sovereignty. Although President Obama has praised the $7.5 billion five-year aid program approved by Congress last week, Pakistani officials have objected to provisions that require U.S. monitoring of this uh, package. That was in October. Then on November 1st, when Secretary Clinton was uh, visiting there, the Los Angeles Times had this in one of their stories. At a televised town hall meeting in Islamabad, the capital, on Friday, a woman in a mostly female audience characterized U.S. drone missile strikes on suspected terrorist targets in northwestern Pakistan as de facto acts of terrorism. A day earlier in Lahore, a college student asked Clinton why every student who visits the U.S. is viewed as a terrorist. The opinions Clinton heard weren't the strident voices of radical clerics or politicians with anti-U.S. agendas. Some of the most biting criticisms came from well-mannered university students and respected seasoned journalists, a reflection of the breadth of dissatisfaction Pakistanis have with U.S. policy toward their country. Uh, then December 3rd in the Washington Post, President Obama's new strategy for combating Islamist terror ins insurgents in Afghanistan fell on skeptical ears Wednesday in next door Pakistan, a much larger nuclear armed state that Obama said was at the core of the plan and had even more at stake than Afghanistan, is this, the transatlantic legislative dialogue. The chairman of the European de uh, delegation actually at one point criticized the U.S., and all these people were very nice people, but he criticized the U.S. for uh, not spending enough on foreign aid. And for many years, I've heard uh, people say that, well, foreign aid is only a little over 1% of our entire budget. Yet they don't stop to think that uh, about half of what the Department of Defense does now is just pure foreign aid. We've almost turned the Department of Defense into the Depart Department of Foreign Aid, uh, particularly in Iraq and Afghanistan. We're spending money to do things in other countries through every department and agency of the federal government, and it's, that's foreign aid that we, we, that we don't get credit for. We're actually spending hundreds of billions in other countries and, or have spent hundreds of billions in really pure foreign aid uh, over the last several years. And I asked a few days ago for the latest figure from the Congressional Research Service on how much aid we had given to Pakistan over the last few years, since 2003. And this, this wouldn't even count all the money that's been given through all these other departments and agencies, but, but people also don't realize that in addition to the traditional foreign aid program, we come up with these other bills, like the seven and a half billion one that we just passed, and before that, since 2003, we'd given 15, uh, 15 15.4, three nine fifteen and a half billion in aid to Pakistan now we've passed another seven and a half billion this is money that we can't afford we're um, we're over 12 trillion dollars in debt we've got almost 60 trillion in unfunded future pension liabilities and then we come along and we spend all this money to give all this money to Pakistan 
And then what do they do? They criticize us. It seems to me that, uh, that it takes an extreme amount of gall for a country to accept 15 and a half billion in aid from us and now seven and a half billion coming on top of that in addition to all the other things and then come out with just one anti-American statement after another. Uh, it, it, it just, it really bothers me and I would say to, to, to the leadership in Pakistan, if they, if, if they don't like uh, what we're doing, please turn down this money. The problem is all these countries, Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, all of them, they all want our money. And that's, all this is about, it's about money and power, and it's not, uh, it's not doing us uh, any good at all. It just seems to be increasing anti-American feelings. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Duncan. Mr. Fortenberry, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to you all for joining us today. I'm sorry I didn't have the benefit of your earlier testimony. Uh, some of what I may ask you may appear redundant, uh, given what you talked about earlier in my cursory review of some of your, your, comment, your written comments. But it seems to me that uh, the outcome here is that this is a big mess. Uh, if I could summarize it succinctly, um, Dr. Wilder, I picked up on a statistic in your um, written testimony that uh, basically 75 percent of the aid is going to 2 percent of the population. Uh, is that a key finding? Is that correct? No, I think that was the uh, 750 million dollars of U.S. Uh, assistance is going to the federally administered tribal areas, FATA, which is uh, make up two percent of the population. But there is a much larger USAID program as well, which is also going to other parts of the country. Uh, okay, but but the total—it's my understanding—the total contribution is 1.5 billion. With the new um, Kerry Luger um, bill, that's the proposal is one and a half billion per year over a five year period. Yeah, so but that's not been appropriate. Framing it yet. simply, then half of the money is going to a very narrow, narrowly targeted area. And that's correct. And you've made the, the suggestion that the linkages between poverty mini mitigation and social services are not achieving the hearts and minds strategy there, if not achieving security outcomes that you would hope to be an intended consequence of capacity building. Look, I'm, I'm very much for cups of tea strategy where you relationship build and establish communications, establish trust, partnerships that can lead then to mutual understanding and long-term continuity in capacity building. But given some of the uh, complexities as to how this is targeted, as to how it uh, is institutionalized, uh, it, it seems to me you're raising very critical points that uh, we may have to rethink some of this in, with the intended outcome of strengthening the partnership and alliance for the long-term security situation of the region, not to mention the social justice outcomes we want to see for, for impoverished people around the world. Is that a pretty correct summary of what I've gleaned thus far? Yeah, the point I was trying to make is that there is evidence that our development aid actually can have very positive development outcomes. Um, I think where we don't have the evidence is the positive security outcomes. And that's where I'm arguing we probably need in some of these contexts to delink those two and value development as a good in and of itself, even if it doesn't end up making people like us. Um, because FATA, the needs are tremendous. Uh, it's, although I would like to point out it's actually not the poorest region in Pakistan. Uh, there's things that can be done there. I personally, though, don't think that we can spend $750 million effectively in a five-year time frame in an a highly insecure environment like uh, FATA. So I think then you can end up fueling corruption and some of your aid can end up having perverse and negative consequences. But I think it's not to say we shouldn't be doing anything in FATA, and it shouldn't, it's certainly not that we shouldn't be doing, trying to do lots in Pakistan, but we should be very aware that where our aid development is good for achieving promoting development objectives, it's not, there's not evidence that it's really good for promoting our security right. objectives yeah, in Pakistan. Maybe I misstated that earlier. Maybe I said 75 percent of our aid is going to 2 percent. I meant 750 million of the aid is going to 2 percent. Right. What is the, let's unpack this a little bit further, the other bilateral relationships that Pakistan enjoys and then the collective or cumulative effect of the aid that is pouring in there to either further complicate uh, your findings 
assuming their objectives are the same in terms of long-term security, uh, uh, stabilization, as well as social justice outcomes. Um, can, you, can any of you give me any insight into the other donor countries and the approaches there? And I want to say this as well, and this is, dovetails with the question. It seems to me there's this raging dualism in Pakistan with, regarding, with regard to the United States. Uh, we want the money, we'd like your money, but we don't want to be your friend, maybe, except behind closed doors. Um, and so is that uh, a distinction in terms of other bilateral relationships that the country enjoys? Yes, Dr. Fair. Well, there are a couple of programs I'm familiar with. DFID has an interesting approach. So DFID does the same kinds of programs that, that we do. I, I believe there is coordination with DFID, for example, taking the lead in Baluchistan. The, oh, sorry, the, the British, thank you, um, the, the British aid organization, DFID. But they're also very interested in doing what I'd suggested in my written testimony, which is supporting their supply-driven efforts. So, for example, whatever intervention they're, they're trying to do, they're trying to support it with uh, a civil society outreach to create demand. So the example I gave was corruption. So it's one thing to try to clean up a particular bureaucracy or a particular service delivery, but unless you also engage in civil society to educate people that actually, while it may be efficient to pay a bribe to get a phone line, that in fact it makes everyone's lives more difficult. So they're, they're really interested in trying to build this demand for change, even while they try to supply it. The Canadian agency, CETA, is much smaller in profile. Um, they work primarily through NGOs, and, and they seem to have a very different aid delivery model. So one thing that USAID might want to do is look at these different organizations. The Japanese are also heavy investors. They've also heavily securitized their aid. And when I've seen analysis of the Japanese aid program, there are very similar critiques to those of USAID. Now, Pakistan has a lot of other partners, which they, they tend to use to bribe us. So if you don't do X, Y, Z for us, we'll, we'll go to China. Um, of course, they have a very important relationship with Saudi Arabia. They also get, um, and it's pretty hard to discern, um, a lot of money through, uh, we can't say they get money from Saudi Arabia per se, they get money from remittances, they get money from religious organizations. So there's actually quite a bit of money going in. You know, I've actually, one of the things that's so frustrating um, in dealing with the Pakistanis is that um, they tend to view our aid as an entitlement. So when we cut the aid back, it's viewed as a penalty. And because they view it as an entitlement, this issue of sovereignty, you know, how dare you, you say that we're your important ally, but now you want to actually subject the way we deal with your money with scrutiny. And this has been a very longstanding problem, and it's pervasive not only in USAID, it's pervasive. We saw this with the coalition support funds. Virtually any program that we have with the Pakistanis, it's well, subjected uh, to these problems. Mr. Chairman, if you could indulge me just one more moment. Is this a, a kind of a purposeful dualism in order to, again, because of the internal political dynamics, uh, create a, a, a position of authority and power and legitimacy in the country versus, again, behind closed doors, needing actually needing the aid for long-term governmental stability objectives? I actually do believe that to be the case. Yeah. So let, a really good example of that is the drones. The reality is the drones do not kill that many civilians. I have this from very well-placed Pakistani sources. Their administration knows this. The drones are run from Pakistani territory. It's done with their permission. We're not obviously running drone operations in a rogue way. But ra and in fact, in Pakistan, the, the drone distress has changed. During SWAT, when four million people were being displaced, if you read some of the op-eds, they were saying, why don't we have drones? Because drones don't displace millions of people. But the civilian government, rather than taking advantage, advantage of this, has continued to whip up anti-American sentiment over drones. Yet I assure you, if we stopped the drone attacks, their security would be worse, not better, in, in my opinion. So I think they do try to create this wedge, because it then gives them an out to do less when we're asking them to do more. And I particularly see this on the security side of things. They're constantly asking for more. They're constantly talking about their sacrifices, which is, which is reasonably fair. But I think that we have not struck a good bargain. You know, on the main, you know, they've been marginally satisfiers. And this is true across the board in, in many of our engagements with them. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, I want to give Dr. Ahmed a chance to talk about something here. And I, I think it will be helpful, or hopefully helpful to all of us on that. When we were doing the so-called Kerry Luger uh, Berman bill, uh, a number of us were adamant that there be conditions in that bill. Uh, there was some sensitivity to try to um, give the civilian 
government more authority because we wanted them to extend their writ throughout the entire country in a non-discriminatory way and to sort of gain some um, ability to deal with the budget of the military and to take some control over that as most civil democracies would have. So the conditions were put on the military money. All right, and, and basically one of the conditions that must be met is that they do extend their writ uh, over the entire country if they're going to continue to get the military assistance on that. And Dr. Ahmed, I'd like you to talk a little bit about the relationship between the military establishment uh, and the civilian government on that, because it's been my distinct view, as I think you well know and others, is that the recalcitrant here, we have all sorts of corruption issues and incompetence issues on the civilian side, uh, but we have some very serious issues on the military side about just uh, how much they want to impact all the policy decisions as well as the strategic and implementing decisions on that and uh, how much control they have over it and, and the pushback that you get and how they utilize uh, this sort of narrative uh, that, oh, you can't put conditions on us, you're interfering with our sovereignty, um, you're treating us like a stepchild and uh, all of that to get their way of not relinquishing authority that uh, in most democracies uh, would be shared or uh, primarily come from the civilian government. Would you speak to that? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, in all of the Q&A, the one thing that seems to have been ignored so far is this is a very young democratic transition. After almost a decade of military rule, you have a elected government, and, and civilians might not be the, might not be the most uh, efficient of actors, but let's not forget they are also in government after a very long time. When we say Pakistanis, I think we also need to make a very clear distinction here. Who are we talking about? Are we talking about the elected civilian representatives, the Pakistani people, or the military establishment? On the enhanced partnership with Pakistan, and I know that this has been taken, uh, taken a number of folks in, on the hill by surprise, why is it that there was such an outcry on the military uh, conditionalities and actually certification requirements placed by Congress. It was a pushback. It should have been expected. You have a military that is not either interested in sharing power or in, 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 in seeing the United States actually engage with the civil as opposed to only the military as an actor. Um, one of the reasons why you have an anti-American uh, perception amongst the Pakistani people is there was no engagement with the Pakistani people for almost a decade. Why then is there again surprise here that there is neither any knowledge of or any understanding that the United States is a partner? Because they, the Pakistani people, Pakistani civil society, have only seen U.S. government partnered with the Pakistani military. Here is now an opportunity with a young democratic transition to change that equation and to truly win hearts and minds in the real sense of the word. And I do think Secretary Clinton's visit to Pakistan, yes, she faced some very difficult questioning. And it was good because she, I think, began to understand that a public outreach needed to have been done on an emergency basis. And, and I think there will be a focus now uh, in reaching out to the Pakistani people, to an elected government, to elected institutions, as opposed to only partnering in what was the war on terror with the Pakistani military. The conditionalities issue, again, you know, I personally believe that there was not a sufficient attempt made in terms of public outreach to inform the Pakistani public and opinion makers that there were no conditionalities on economic assistance. Can I just interject? First of all, um, I would contest that a little bit of everything because I took several trips there and had a number of conversations with those people directly on that point. So uh, I was any, any upset nature and that was perfectly willful uh, on people not wanting to at that time. But there's great control of the military, at least influence of the military, on the media. Uh, and that was there. The media almost exclusively sang the song of the military on that, and that drove public opinion considerably on, on that whole notion as well. Uh, so that was, um, that was a large part of the problem. But here we see a lot of the problem, of, and I listened to Mr. Duncan's comments, and they're always enlightening, you know, he's, he's zeroed in on some of the issues here, but uh, people in this country uh, see a balance right now between what their own needs are 
in terms of our economy uh, on that, and they do see foreign aid as something that, uh, in one sense, they want to do and they understand the implications of that, but almost a need to justify it, and the e easiest or most uh, available way to justify it sometimes is the security aspect of it. So I think that's where it gets tied in, and we need to break that out and, and rationalize it better on that. The the, the whole idea of the, of the uh, USAID's capacity, uh, Dr. Fair, is, is this. Look, they, they don't spend a lot of their money on monitoring and evaluation. They spend a very small portion of their budget, unfortunately, vis-a-vis -vis other agencies. And, and I think you would agree they have to ramp them up. Am I correct on that? Um, and so we need to do that. But um, as long as they don't have the capacity, and we talked about program, education programs where, as you say, they could tell the number of teachers that were in a classroom, but they had four people on their staff of the entire country of Pakistan to go around and evaluate the quality of the program, whether or not the teachers were actually teaching anything worth learning, or even whether they were showing up every day on that. So uh, are you of a mind that we're, we're right to take a look? First of all, let me just ask you, tell us a little bit about your remarks that you made in your written uh, testimony about education and whether we ought not to think about pulling back on education and redirecting our resources uh, a little differently there, and, and I think that would be helpful for us. Well. I've sort of become a fatalist on this education issue. One, since 9-11, there was so much focus on this madrasa stuff. Now, to be very clear, full-time madrasa utilization is actually quite rare in Pakistan. There have been a number of very interesting estimates, but they aren't supported by, by robust estimates using a variety of survey instruments. And this has caused, well, in the madrasas, for example, that are involved in terrorism, I view them as a law enforcement and intelligence problem, and they are well known to Pakistan's intelligence agency because they have been using them to create militants for quite some time. So I've, I have been in principle opposed to the United States trying to get into madrasa reform. It also undercuts those people who are important that are seeking madrasa reform on their own, because it kind of makes them look like American you know, lackeys. On the public education sector, which is a provincial subject, you have because of the capacity issue, trying to shove large sums of money down a small pipe <coughs> results in this outcome-driven stuff. You know, how many teachers can we churn out? And there was no impact of, did the, in, was there any impact on the training? It's just how many teachers have we trained? Um, that's why I focus, I find a more interesting approach is an information-driven approach. Um, the World Bank has done some really interesting stuff reporting teacher absenteeism, reporting uh, student performance, school performance. And when there are cost-neutral ways, parents actually shift as a result of this information. I've also become a fan of doing what we do best, and that is uh, encouraging competition. The World Bank found that when there are private schools in the mix, and when there's information about school performance, it actually produces uh, it, it, it compels the public sector to also improve. So I think we should probably be looking at doing what we do best, and that is improving quality through competition. Um, somewhat of a, now, this does not mean that we should not be working with the ministries to improve their effectiveness to, to deliver services, but simply relying upon those given the pervasive problems, and quite frankly, they don't want us interfering. I mean, they, as you said yourself, they have resisted all sorts of monitoring, and I think there are a number of reasons for it. I'm also somewhat skeptical of relying upon elected officials as the silver bullet, in part because of Pakistan's young democratic transition, but also in larger measure due to the way legislators are oriented vis-a-vis -vis their constituents. They don't does, they don't deliver policy, they deliver patronage. So when you look at local governance initiatives, for example, we supported that, although it was really to support Musharraf because he wanted local governance because it was a new way of patronage to create a series of supporters for his initiatives. But the execution of aid, from what I can tell there, it really becomes contracts are given out to friends of the local administrators. So. I, Again, this kind of goes back to we really have to try a variety of different mechanisms. All of the available mechanisms have a number of various serious problems, and I suspect each of those mechanisms have their own particularly monitoring requirements that would actually help them to be effective. But the capacity at USAID, if you don't have the capacity, it's simply irresponsible to shove all this money down the system because of the corruption. For, I have never heard people complain about the generosity of our aid because of the corruption, whether I go to uh, some shopkeeper in a Narkley Bazaar in Lahore or uh, a newspaper editor, they're all saying the same thing. When you give money on this scale to these ministries, you make things worse for us, not better. 
Let's follow on that <clears throat> talk of corruption for a bit. In Afghanistan, we've seen a couple of types of corruption on a large scale, uh, both individual governors or provincial authorities uh, pocketing money uh, that's given, um, or, or uh, NGOs and others having to pay uh, people to get a load of freight from one city to another. What type of corruption are we more likely to see in Fatah or in, uh, elsewhere in Pakistan? Uh, is, is it the, the former or the latter or all kinds, or what would, should we be more concerned about uh, given the, the pace at which this aid is being distributed? Dr. Wilder. I think in any country in the world, if you give vast amounts of money uh, with little oversight, um, you're going to end up fueling corruption. And I think that's where I think we need to be committed for the long term in terms of our development programs to building capacity so that over time we can spend more money. But we need to link our funding levels to the, not to the need, which are great, but to the capacity to spend money accountably and effectively. And I think that's where we're not seeing in the Afghanistan context, and I fear is going to be the problem in Pakistan. I am a firm believer we need a long-term commitment in our aid program to Pakistan, but I think we will be fueling corruption if we try to give too much money too quickly that's not linked to local capacities. And I think there um, it will be across the board. I'm not in terms of Im implementation, who should be doing the implementa implementing? Um, the chairman raised that in the opening remarks. Um, I think we should, it's not an either or question. We need to be working with NGOs. We need to be working with the government. We need to be looking at local actors and international actors because capacity is limited. We need all of the capacity we have, but again, all of those uh, will be problematic if you try to push t too much money through the system. And I think that's what we are seeing. Um, I mean, the idea that we should do all only through local actors, I mean, I think that that's a problem. In Afghanistan, we're seeing many of the local actors <laughs> don't have a good face. I mean, they're all linked to the key ministers and, and relatives, and, and it's creating, again, um, I think very perverse negative consequences then, there. Um, I also wanted to just touch one thing on, to, on to the, uh, Congressman Fortenberry's dualism point, um, and in terms of how different other donors um, handle this. And, and I think most of the European donors do tend to securitize their aid to a lesser degree than the U.S. There is more distinction between their aid programs, which have development budgets, and then their more political uh, resources. And I think that that's, in a way, where I think we need to go uh, in, with the, in the U.S. because precisely for the reason that it's easier to get money if you justify that it's going to have security benefits it's also then very easily, and I think we heard that from Congressman Duncan, that we can easily delegitimize foreign aid when it ends up not making people like us. Um, and if they don't, if our money isn't going to make them like us, let's then stop giving them money. And I think that's a danger I see with our current securitized aid. Whereas in Pakistan, if we could distinguish our development objectives, we could then be very happy that our health programs have had a, a significant impact in Pakistan over decades uh, in terms of improved health indicators, reductions in maternal infant mortality rates. USAID in the past contributed to a very effective development of a health um, MI, uh, management information system, which has been important. Support to the lady health worker programs. I, I think we, should, we need to be cautious not to assume that all the USAID programs have had no impact. There have been positive development impacts over time. Um, and, and, but I think if we're looking for them to like us as a result of our aid programs, then we're going to be disappointed. And I fear that that's going to then over time uh, reduce uh, U.S. Um, public support for our foreign aid programs. Uh, so again, I would argue for a greater dualism in our foreign aid uh, funding to Pakistan between our development objectives and our more political and security objectives. Uh, and lastly on that, in terms of um, uh, local perceptions of conditionality, I don't think you'll have any Pakistani, again, objecting to conditionalities on how our aid money can be spent in a more transparent and less corrupt way so that in our health funding to the health sector, we demand accountability for how that money is spent. I think the problems are in the conditionalities in the political realm relating to the military, civil, civil military relations, the nuclear program, various aspects like, program like that. That's what generates a lot of um, unhappiness in Pakistan. Thanks.
if I, in my short remaining time, just we're going to be questioning administration witnesses coming up here soon, um, hopefully early next year. What's the one question, the most important question we need to ask in terms of their capacity uh, to, to monitor this aid? I mean, is it ramping up significantly the, the personnel or the, the areas in which they do oversight among themselves or, or what? What, what, uh, what's the most important thing for us to ask and to have them answer? Dr. Fair? Well, you kind of said it in your question. Do they have the capacity to execute this money responsibly? This civilian surge, I mean, I, I'm, I'm wondering where these civilians are coming from. Um, I don't, yes, exactly. <laughs> you know, they, many of them have no experience in South Asia. They are there for short-term contracts. So even if they plus up the numbers, this does not in any way, shape or form, make me confident that they're gonna be able to execute uh, this funding program responsibly. Dr. Weiler, do you have anything to add to that? Same. No, I just share the same concerns. Again, that if we have, if we need that long-term commitment to support for Pakistan, but linked to our capacity, and I think it's not. I think the security constraints, the security situation, gets continues to deteriorate um, in Pakistan. And yesterday's news was not, you know, positive in that regard. Um, the capacity of, of USAID. Um, um, uh, staff to actually do um, monitoring and oversight is going to be limited. So just more numbers of people sitting in the embassy compound with very secure, severe constraints on their mobility um, is not necessarily, I think, going to increase the capacity. I mean, I think oh, in, in general, globally, I would argue we need to be investing a lot more in rebuilding USAID's capacity to program and implement pro, uh, projects so that they don't have to subcontract it all out. But right now, in the short term in Pakistan, I think that, and similarly in Afghanistan, civilian surges, there are big questions about what all these civilians are going to be able to do, both in terms of what their capacities they bring to the table, but also even those who would be effective are going to be so constrained in that in insecure environment that you know, I, don't, I don't see that that in itself is going to um, increase capacity sufficient to monitor the sheer volume of money we're talking about trying to spend within a fairly limited five-year time frame in Pakistan. Thank you. Thank you for your indulgence. Oh, no, thank you. Um, yeah, we have the, the capacity problem, and, and obviously one, excuse me a second. Oh, you're back. <laughs> excuse me, Mr. Fortenberry, five minutes. Doing the disappearing at the Houdini thing. <laughs> life as a public official. I, I th let me, let me uh, go back to some of my earlier comments. Um, they were not intended, and I don't think they came across this way, but let me clarify, to disparage USAID outreach for capacity building. But I think as you further um, um, discuss the points, uh, your comments were very germane, Dr. Ahmed, and that this is a fledgling democracy. Uh, we work off of certain operational assumptions, premises, that uh, there is going to be capacity to absorb this type of aid quickly. Uh, and whenever you're not dealing with well-defined institutions, institutions that aren't necessarily fully reflective of the principles of self-determination and therefore are not going to be more transparent and have power consolidated into the hands of fewer institutions, fewer people who may be in a situation to manipulate, your outcomes are going to be messy and difficult. I think the, the benefit, though, of this hearing is actually look, staring that in the face under the very real constraints, though, of the geopolitical urgency in the area and the new evolving U.S. strategy of security, capacity, and stability based upon a wedding of... Uh, uh, military operations, as well as uh, um, social outreach and in, in, in institutional s civil society building. We've had other hearings where we just directly talked about whether or not the military itself, as they had to learn quickly how to do in Iraq, is better positioned in some ways to deliver the types of uh, social service um, inputs uh, for capacity building in a very insecure situation versus a civilian component, which may not have the ability to deal with the security situation adequately. So we're in a very constrained situation. I think that's the point. The, the, the institutions 
aren't sufficiently developed. We have a policy based upon the nature of our government where we have to do things quickly because of changing political dynamics, as, but the urgency of the security situation as well is compelling us to make this move as difficult as it is. Now, I understand the intention that what you're talking about to separate the outcome measures of how you might be implementing a health care clinic and, 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 and what the, the outcome of that is versus did it, did it stabilize the, the, the institutional capacities for, again, governance and security for the people over the long term. We just don't have, we don't have strategic long-term thinking. Everybody recognizes that, but it's very hard to have that with the nature of our political system, with the nature of the, again, geopolitical movements in the arena, and with uh, nuclear weapons sitting over the horizon, potentially falling into hands of people with very twisted ideologies who want to do us grave harm. That might be beyond the uh, the realm of what uh, your expertise is, given the, the uh, very good comments you had in terms of making our, our, our efforts more effective. But that's the constraints that we're operating under, and I guess your, your recommendations, short of, I heard what you said, separating the objectives of security and social capacity building and measuring those distinctly. I think if we had time, the investment in social justice outcomes does pay security dividends. I think it's a matter of time. The truncated allocation, though, of time compresses this into an artificial period without the capacities to absorb it quickly, without the experiential level, perhaps on our side, as you were just suggesting. The last thing we need is people holed up in an embassy who are spending a lot of money, who can't get out and do good things, or who are doing good things, empowering the wrong people that are actually undermine the stability of the society over the long term. So that's a, a long editorial comment on just how, how I think complex this is. And if you want to talk about any other recommendations, given again the constraints of time and the nature of the political system there as well as ours, that we improve the chances of meeting the dual goals of social justice but also security. Yes. Um, mostly my work is on security issues, so counterinsurgency. And, and it's very, I understand what you're saying, but when there's no data that justifies that what we're doing has any impact, and it seems to be having a negative impact upon our strategic relationship with the country, I think that justifies calming down this faux timeline of urgency. But let me give you a really good example of what's going on in Pakistan. I don't like to call it counterinsurgency because what they're doing is not population-centric coin. It's actually low-intensity conflict, which is resulting in massive damage and huge displacements of persons. But um, even if they can clear an area, they've traditionally had problems with holding. Um, and this is because, for example, they have inadequate police uh, that, are, that are able to do this holding. And in counterinsurgency, that's exactly the agency that should be doing holding. I know that Dr. Emmett has done a lot of work on police reform in Pakistan. We would like to bring Dyncor in there and churn out police in large numbers over a week. That's not how you make police. Um, so if you want to do clear, hold, and build, you can't get to the build part if there's no security. The Pakistanis have not shared with us their operational plans. After they conduct an operation... Do they have them? They don't, for example, in SWAT. If you're going to think about build, you need to have, as a part of your planning, the civilian component, for example, the relief to the IDPs. If they had coordinated with us their operational plans, we could have helped them put into place the civilian relief. Now, the Army is, says that, they're, that they have cleared their holding and they're waiting for the inept civilians to come in. That's their narrative. It's the inept civilians. Of course, the civilians are inept because they've been hallowed out for 10 years. But if they had actually been genuine partners with us, we could have helped them think through what would be the civilian requirement. So another concern that I have, other than this fake urgency, and I say fake urgency because we impose this upon ourselves when, in fact, I don't believe we can execute this aid program effectively in the time constraints and in the quantity with the quality and given the security environment, this is just seems an impossible task. But we certainly can't do it without Pakistani partners. 
And when I look at different sectors, another good example that has immediate security implications is justice sector. One of the things that the Taliban do well <laughs> is actually justice provision. They go around, they can resolve, court, uh, resolve disputes expeditiously, not complicated things, family disputes, land disputes, there's no recidivism. Um, justice is really key, yet the Asian Development Bank, and I believe Dr. Wilder is more knowledgeable with this than I am, has spent millions of dollars doing justice sector reform. What they want is the, the computerized case management. They want the, the courthouses to be redone. But what they don't want is actual human capital development. So I'll make the other argument that it's not only uh, the limitations of USAID, numbers, their security environment, but it's also the, the the political system in which our partners are embedded. And this comes to a much larger issue, which I think Dr. Wilder knows a lot more about than I do, and that's civil service reform. So you keep rolling back um, the things that have to happen before we can effectively spend these, kinds, these sums of money effectively, and you realize there's no substitute to anything but a long-term commitment to capacity building. Thank you. The, um the point that was made earlier about the uh, USAID um, in terms of the numbers of personnel, the capacity is, is well taken, and, and we spent some time on that. I think as disturbing to those of us that were visiting there just a, a little bit ago was they have six-month rotations. Six-month rotations. So if you're a USAID worker, how much oversight can you do uh, for a project that's two, three, or five years uh, in a contract length? Uh, so I think that's just another impediment, looking at the whole structure of how we, how we do staff up uh, the USAID and what their uh, appointments are in, on that basis. Do, is, do we run any risk, let me ask you this, in terms of um, security, if we were to slow down the distribution of aid in the Northwest Frontier Province and in Fatah until we had in place uh, a system and a mechanism for compiling the data that would tell us where best to allocate the resources, uh, to prioritizing them, putting together an implementation plan, putting together an effective uh, monitoring plan, an evaluation plan of that, um, and, and moving at a much slower pace uh, than is anticipated sometimes when we talk about this kind of insurgency we're going to do all at once. We're going to go in, secure, hold build the world again and, and, uh, and move on. What security risk, if any, do we, do we run in slowing things down and, and doing it as I've described? Doctor? One of the things we have to recognize, and, and I agree with you, Congressman, what the, these are stark choices. Stark choices for regional security and for global security, emerging out of a very ugly conflict. So I don't think we have the luxury of time, frankly speaking, to sit around and look at the data, assess it, look at the mechanisms, do all these studies, and then decide what kinds of interventions are possible at all. Um, let me also say this, Afghanistan and Pakistan are two different countries. There's a different level of capacity in Pakistan from that of Afghanistan. What you need in Pakistan, what you need in Afghanistan is to build the institutions. What you need in Pakistan is to reform the institutions. And there, I think you can actually use, use a quite assist effectively to ensure that you're building the capacity of the institutions in terms of reform. There is a police force, there is a judiciary, there is a civil service. None of this has to be, there are political parties, there is a legislature, nothing has to be created by the United States. But finding the partners that you will need in the meantime and building their capacity quite obviously is a multi-year multi endeavor. Which is why I think this bill is a good bill, because it is a multi-year investment in Pakistan. But at the same time, we have to look at different types of tasks that have to be undertaken. The IDPs, the in internally displaced people, do we wait another few years uh, before we decide what are their needs and how do we access them and how do we actually make sure that there is a semblance of stability that returns to what is actually a fairly large part of Pakistan? Uh, not just in Fata, but also in Malakan Division. Should we be working right now with the civil administration, the ministries, and the elected representatives? And I, I beg to differ. 
You know, these are not just patron-client relationships. These are elected representatives. Let's give them their due here. They do know their constituents. They meet their constituents. We can use all the channels that we have right now to assess, first of all, the urgent needs and the urgent programming that needs to be done, and then the middle, the medium term and long term. Let me also say this, I agree with Dr. Wilder. I think we are forgetting one thing. There have been long-term programs that USAID has run in Pakistan, in the fields of health and education and infrastructure building. But what we have right now is a crisis, and we have to respond to that as well as talk in terms of what should be looking ahead in terms of a partnership. So I understand it, 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 you have a sort of mixed view on that. There are things that need to be done right now and things that can await for a, a more nuanced and, and planned aspect on that. Uh, but if I could press you just a little bit on that, what security risks uh, would be confronted if, in fact, we, we did just that? We just took care of some immediate needs, the crisis aspect of that and the humanitarian aspect on that, uh, and then had a more thoughtful uh, approach in the long run instead of just putting all the money out there right now. I do think that, that if, if, uh, if the programming is actually divided into the quick impact, humanitarian needs, development needs, based uh, projects, to the medium term projects, with a certain degree of consultation which is in there, and which frankly speaking, there's another factor we should be looking at, which again has been neglected as thus far in this discussion, is on the survivability of the democratic transition. Because if this political order disintegrates, we're not back to square one. Thank you. Dr. Wilder. Yeah, I also think the situation is urgent and, and deteriorating. Um, my only question is whether money is going to reverse that if it's spent ineffectively. And I think that's where the real focus needs to be, how do we spend the money accountably and effectively? Then I think there can be positive benefits from it. And, and I think that's where um, you know, throwing money at the problem in short time frames is not going to, it's going to exacerbate matters. And I think that's what we're seeing in the Afghanistan context. Um, I absolutely agree with Dr. Ahmed's point that Pakistan and Afghanistan are very different. And I think the, 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 the issue of the civil service is a critical difference there, where you do have a history of um, an, an inherited institution, um, which was very strong. And it's been, um, uh, weekend over time, um, overly politicized, uh, there, and there, but I, I, I included this in my written remarks, but I didn't really have time to comment on it today, but just the importance of prioritizing civil service reform. And I actually think that this is an area of opportunity where the U.S. can help. It's an area where the U.S. government has tended not to uh, take a lead role um, and left it up to donors like um, the British and the World Bank. Um, and I, I think it's maybe not a comparative advantage where the U.S. has to lead on it, but certainly to support multilateral efforts for a long-term effort to um, uh, strengthen the civil service and public administration reform in general in Pakistan. In the past, civil service, the problems in civil service reform are not technical ones, they're political ones. And, and those, the main actors who um, uh, need to push the reform, have a vested interest in maintaining the status quo, which is working quite well. Um, but the push for reform in the past has come at times when Pakistan has had been in crisis financially, IMF conditionalities, um, and the consequences are often viewed in terms of downsizing and, and negatively. I think that now that there are resources, there is an opportunity to have a politically smart strategy of incentivizing some of the critically important reforms that need to take place. Um, and I, I would put this forward as one concrete way where I think the U.S. could engage with and support in its resources of a um, multilateral initiative to, to push civil service reform in Pakistan. Um, a more general point is I think it, it is in, the, the, um, when you have, are the lead donor and have lots of money to spend quickly, there is also a tendency to try to do it alone. Um, there are, I think this is an area where the U.S. is not always very good in working with the other multilateral and bilateral donors in Pakistan, and I would urge that as a concrete uh, recommendation that our aid effort there try to be, work more closely with the uh, multilateral and bilateral partners, and I think in that, that's one way of trying to ensure that it will be more effective. Thank, Thank you. Jeff, you have more questions? Then not, let me just close with one, if uh, you'll indulge me for a second on that. 
Um, so I'm hearing very clearly that, that we need to take care of, on a humanitarian basis those emergencies and crises, and I, and I clearly understand that. Uh, that we also need to, with respect to the rest of the monies, not be so anxious to just put it out there somewhere, but to get together a plan of how we're going to engage local people, uh, really get their cooperation and input, uh, have them take some responsibility and accountability for it, and develop your plan for implementation, oversight, and all of that, which is good. I don't hear anybody saying there's going to be negative uh, security implications if we take that path. Am I correct? You think there will be negative security in place? No. Okay. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. So we heard nothing on that, on that basis there. So my last question to each of you is, can you give me examples of the types of incentives that could be used to facilitate um, the civilian government moving forward on reform? And to the extent necessary, of course, having the, the military uh, not impede that on that basis. What types of incentives might be put in place uh, to make that happen? Because I think one of the problems is the will. Is there a will of the current structure who's, uh, I think, benefiting quite a bit from the chaos and, and the way we're distributing money right now and, and the uh, inherent corruption and aspects on that? So if we could just go once over, we'll let you go. Thanks. Well, FATA, for example, that aid should have been conditional upon the Pakistan government having a plan for political integration. The FATA development plan, which they marketed as integration, had nothing to do with political integration, something as simple as extending the Political Parties Act so that FATA has genuine representation of the, of the kind that Dr. Emmett talked about would have been incredibly valuable. I think that whatever ministry we engage, they need to come up with a plan. Now, so often when I've read these plans, it looks as if an international contractor wrote them because of the uh, particular idiomatic English that's been employed. The Pakistanis themselves should come up with outcome measures, and we should agree upon the data that will be used to monitor success along those outcomes. And there needs to be a pretty serious plan for remediation if those outcome measures aren't met. So what I'm basically saying is that we need to incentivize the Pakistani government to be partners rather than merely, you know, recipients. And I'm, I'm only just now imagining what the reaction will be when we, when we, <laughs> we do that. We had a visit of about 30 military people at one point in time who came in with their hair on fire and had an opportunity to speak up in Cambridge, uh, Massachusetts, on another occasion where um, all the time, when I finished speaking in, in defense of the conditions, because we had been involved in putting them on, uh, one half of the room stood up to berate us for treating them like children, and the other half of the room stood up to tell us, you should have stronger conditions on it, you can't trust us. So yeah, it goes on. Dr. Wilder. Yeah, again, just to reiterate, don't ignore the civil service. I think that's an opportunity. Um, I would also say that there's a tendency often uh, for the U.S. government to prefer to work with executive authority um, and, and, and the military, and I think we should not ignore the parliament in Pakistan. And I think there is a USAID is supporting a parliamentary strengthening program, but I think that this is an area it's linked also to the issue of center periphery relations or the relations between the federal government and the provincial government in Pakistan, uh, where there has been a tendency, I think, for, to overly centralize powers at the federal level. And I think working through parliament and trying to strengthen parliament could be a positive. It's something I think the U.S. aid should continue uh, doing. Um, and finally, just to also to end on a, a, a positive note, is that uh, the civil bullet yeah, arrives. <laughs> that, <laughs> Uh, USAID has provided valuable support to the electoral process in Pakistan. And as someone who did my PhD research on electoral politics in Pakistan and has been present at virtually every uh, election since 1970, um, I was monitoring the la last one, and it was a, a, you know, a considerable improvement over previous ones. And I think that there ha was valuable support from donors in general, and the U.S. in particular, for strengthening that process. Um, but just to end, I mean, I, I think it's important that we, again, try to move away from, again, this feast and famine approach because of the urgency of the moment, the ten tendency to, um, uh, in some ways, often spend too much money in the short term. And as I, I rent mentioned in my written testimony, a Pakistani friend last week told me, try to convince them to view their support to Pakistan as a marathon rather than a series of unsustainable sprints. And I think if I could just end on that note, let's, let's take that long-term approach to our uh, aid, aid program for Pakistan. Thank you. And uh, Dr. You came the longest distance. The final word goes to you.
How do you envision that support, Todd? Is your microphone on, by the way? Okay. And, and um, how do you envision that support? I, 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 we hear a lot of times they need support, the, the civilian government needs support. So just exactly do they have the will to accept the support and do something with it? And how, what exactly would that support look like to be effective? This is a public program that was announced from a public platform. This is not behind the closed doors discussions. Um, the reform package also came as the result of consultations with FATA representatives. But, but I think you said that the military pushback has stopped they, it from being implemented. So absolutely. how do we get beyond that? All you need right now is the president's directive to be, it's called a notification sent to the governor and its law. Uh, and there is where I think the president does need support. As you know, they, that's not the only front in which the president is being attacked. Uh, by the military and other opposition um, power circles. That's the one issue. The second, in terms of the legislature, and I've said this in our report, we said it on our, uh, in the written testimony, and I've, we've said it in our reports and repeatedly, that in delivering assistance, make sure that there is a legislative um, connection to the monitoring aspects and the planning and the implementation aspects. Now, through the public account committees of the provincial and the federal parliaments, and let me say this, these are very good committees and they're functioning well. I think you can, you, you'll have stakeholders then in a process that will also provide that missing link, not just in terms of monitoring, but also in terms of community consultation. Um, so let's go beyond, and I think it's great that USAID is helping build the capacity of the Pakistani legislature, but let's involve the legislators, the, the, the parliamentarians, in the kind of process that we're involved in in Pakistan. You know, their collective history, if you look at how many parliaments they've served, it would be quite a, a couple of hundred years. So these are not novices. It's just that because there was no opportunity at constructive intervention, they were left out of the policy loop. And I think we can engage them now. At, at the risk of being painfully obvious on this, but for the record on that, we talked about Dr. Zadari needing only to issue, Mrs. Zadari needing only to issue um, a directive for that to become law. And then you talk about our support. Are we talking about the need for uh, the United States government through the Secretary of State or the president to make some public de uh, declaratory statement or to work through our Department of Defense with the military to get them to back off? What types of support are you uh, thinking of, of there? I do think welcoming, publicly welcoming the reform effort. This is not a U.S. reform effort. It is not um, in any way without stakeholder consultation would be a useful way to go. So at a high level, coming from the U.S. government. Well, I'm going to have to ask for the panel's forbearance here for a second. Mr. Lynch, would you like to make an opening and a closing in your questions? Well, I, I just, uh, I'm sorry, there's a lot going on here at the same time, uh, but I have been following the testimony in the uh, ante room. Uh, the, the question I had is uh, the, the problems that we've seen on, on both sides of the uh, border uh, along the uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan borders. Uh, at least what we've seen visiting uh, the federally administered tribal areas and the northwest uh, uh, province area, uh, frontier province, uh, are similar to what we're seeing on the, the Afghan side. And that is very weak government institutions that don't get out into those areas. And we seem to have seized upon a model where uh, we, we pair uh, USAID or some other NGO with a, a, a military uh, support group uh, in order to get that done, a PRT model. And that's the model we've been pursuing here. And from what we've been hearing and seeing in Pakistan, is this, is this the right model? Is this the right model that we're using here? Because it it doesn't seem to be the case from this end. And I, I worry about squandering the resources that, that we're dedicating towards this effort. And uh, if we've got to come up with another model that allows us the accountability uh, and, and the transparency that we need to make sure the money's going to the people that we want to help and that it's been being uh, used effectively, 
then we've got to come up with the right idea before we pump more money into this system because otherwise it will just be wasted and I wouldn't blame the American people one bit if they grew frustrated uh, with, you know, just continually pumping money in here. We've got to show some progress. Uh, you know, Dr. Balda, you, you mentioned some of the areas that have received, received the greatest amount of resources have shown very little progress. And so I, I'm wondering, is it the model that we're trying to use, is, is, it, is it the wrong tool for this, uh, for this job? Well, there's a serious problem between the need for quick results when we're not going to get quick results. State building can't be done on the quick. Um, it's a generational thing. It's a long-term process, and that is the critical. But no, just to, just to yeah. distinguish, some of the PRT models are very long-term, mm -hmm. and so it's not, it's not an idea that we're going to go in there with a the PRT and turn things around in a, in a matter of months or, or even a couple of years. It's uh, capacity building. But I'm, I'm more concerned that that framework, the, the pairing of a military unit with uh, the capacity to allow some of the development work to go forward, is, is that the wrong model here? Should we be trying something, something different? Sorry, are you talking about Afghanistan? Because in Pakistan, I think the PRT model would certainly not be a good uh, an option. Um, but in Afghanistan, I, I mean, I think Part of my problem with the PRT model in Afghanistan, it, it, um, I mean, Afghanistan's always ha never had much in the way of government in the same, same way in Fatah in, in these areas. So I'm not sure that it's actually the weak government in some of these areas, which is also fueling the insecurity. But my, my concern with the PRT model is um, the more we end up doing with these civil military teams, the more we end up, in a way, setting up the Afghan government to fail because they don't have the capacity to come in and, and take over. It comp the more we end up doing with our PRTs, the more it complicates an exit strategy because who's going to step in and do the, this eventually? Um, I mean, I think we do need a long-term process of trying to build up government institutions and capacity. Um, but that's not going to happen in the time frames within which even the five-year, ten-year time frames we're talking about in terms of our troop presence in Afghanistan. So I'm, I don't. I, I think this is where the problem is. There isn't. A, there right. isn't a quick fix. And the military, civil military, the PRT model, um, term solution. Okay. I, I do want to say I, thank you uh, for your willingness to come before the committee. Your observations are very helpful to us. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lynch. Again, thank all of you uh, very much. Your, your work has informed a common. Mr. Flake and I were discussing uh, the need for us to uh, try and make sure that some of what you share with us gets reflected uh, in our work going forward uh, on that. So you've been tremendously helpful. We thank you for coming uh, to Washington and thank you for coming all the way from Pakistan as well and for the written uh, testimony. And I know that we can take the liberties of coming back to you again as we do so often, uh, but your help is important and, and thank you very, very much for it. Meeting adjourned.
probably go up somewhat. We're looking for something that could be comfortable to live in. Maybe downsize a little bit, but, but certainly have enough room for people to visit with us. One of the nice things that I think about, uh, about lifestyle down there is such a relaxed way of living and away from the hustle and bustle of the highway. I'm going to miss dressing up. I gave away a lot, most of my high heels. <laughs> hey, because, but beach flats okay. and swimsuits and, and ocean. Yeah, and I'm going to love that, too. Golf attire. Absolutely. It's going to be a wonderful place to live. Yeah, it is. Would you be interested in, uh, in condos, houses, or uh, casitas? Nicaragua is where Costa Rica was 10 years ago. We have developments all around the Pacific Coast. We got affordable land prices. Developments are not too crowded. We got great culture, great people. It's a great destination. You can get a good property for three or $400,000. Decent sized home, around 2,000 square feet. Kent is looking for a golf property and Denise is basically looking for beach, ocean front. So we're trying to find something right in between to suit their needs. Look at the landscaping. It's brand new, you can tell. Yeah. I just put it in. Now, where are we, Frank, exactly? This is Villa Carmen, Ken. Uh huh. I can see the ocean from here. It's way down there. Where's the golf course from here, well, Frank? Well, the, the golf course is right over there, Ken. Ah. This is hole number eight. The floor plan is 3,400 square feet, and the listing is $424,000. It's a four bedroom, three bathroom, and the best thing about it is that you can make your own personal changes to it since it's under construction. Why don't we have a look on the inside? You sure. bet. Wow, look at the size of this room, it's man. It's very ample living space. Ooh, I really like the color on that ceiling. Interesting lighting with the ceiling fans here for some air movement. And the tiles will be easy to take care of. And look at the back door. Ah. And out to the backyard and the terrace. Isn't that gorgeous? It's a great That's view. Great. We got a nice size uh, oh, dining room here yeah. with its own chandelier. How about yeah. this kitchen? Look at it. What happened to the countertops? Well, you have to remember the house is still under construction, you know? And this is what I was talking about, about right. you making your own selections. You can okay. choose your own granite countertops and whatever you like best. So I guess that would be for dishwasher, sink. Yeah, absolutely. The stove over there, the refrigerator. A lot of light. This is an so, excellent, excellent kitchen. Yes. Now, this is a great, you know, back patio. This is a great entertainment spot. It's got a Japanese-style garden, which could eventually, you could replace for a pool. Sure. That's something I would like to have since we're so far away from the beach. Next, they head back in to check out the master bedroom. Oh, look at the high ceilings. Yes. And great color. What do you think, Nice? Look, you think our bed would fit right here? Yes, no question. You think? That's big enough. You think? Mm -hmm. OK, then we can be in bed and see out to the patio over there. Yep. And yeah. Get the TV on wire. Yep. So what's back here? Great master bathroom. Oh, again, beautiful yeah, cabinetry. But no cabinet tops. Yeah. We, get to, we, we can use these two. Yeah, again, it's the same issue. No problem. And a walk-in shower with, look, yeah. that rain, yeah. rain head. Pretty tile. Oh, and look it's at the tub. Deep tub. Soaking tub for two. There you go. I like it. I like the color. The laundry room's back here. Oh, uh, yeah. That's yeah. good. This is the second bedroom. A nice big, you know, open space. It's huge. Yeah. It's beautiful.